Hey everyone, this is Yogi. Thanks for checking out Grub Stakers. This week we're going to be talking about the uh, weapons industry. We'll talk about the Big Five, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Raytheon, Northup Grumman, and Boeing, and civilians being bombed in Yemen. Unfortunately, this week's episode only has one drop because Andy Palmer dropped the ball. Other than that, it's a great episode. Check it out. Enjoy. Because of my success in the private sector, I had the chance to run America's largest city for 12 years. I taught those kids lessons on product development and marketing, and they taught me what it was like growing up feeling targeted for your race. And that's just, that's just not true. You know, I love having the support of real billionaires. Hey everybody, welcome to Grub Stakers. We're back, we're doing it again. Sean P. McCarthy here, joined as always by my friends. Andy Palmer. Yogi Polywall. Steve Jeffries. And uh, this week we'll be doing a special episode on uh, weapons manufacturing and the profit of the death industry, basically. Uh, But before we get there, I did just want a little bit of housekeeping up top. Uh, Last week on the Bill Ackman episode, you might have noticed I made a mistake where I said Senator Carl Levin was the guy who... uh, urged Ackman to only increase prescription drug prices by 30%. It was actually a Democratic senator of Indiana, Joe Donnelly, who said that. Carl Levin was retired at the time. And uh, you might notice, if you listen to the podcast regularly, that about I make about one mistake every episode. And you might attribute that to like laziness or lack of research, but it's actually intentional, and it's for you to catch. It's like a Snapple fact. Yeah. Yeah. I make one mistake in my research At least every week. And, you know, but the point is... uh, We were torturing Sean uh, with basically needles under his skin each time he made a mistake. (laughs) And we started to realize he kind of liked it. So we're kind of out of options for that. Raytheon get the contract to give me a burning sensation under my skin with like a complex microwave thing that they sold to California prisons uh, every time I make a mistake. But the point is... If at any time you're listening, every t- every now and then we do make mistakes. So if you hear a mistake, especially if it is made by Andy, Steve, or Yogi, let us know. And we'll update it on the Tumblr. Um, but you can check out our Tumblr, uh, which the link is on our uh, on the SoundCloud page. It has uh, uh, all the most of the articles we use for research, as well as any corrections if we make mistakes. We do our best. We're not always perfect. Also follow us on Snapchat, Instagram. We're on LinkedIn. <laughs> Photo Bucket, Friendster. Uh, Friendster. All right. Well, that's Stormfront. <laughs> yes. MySpace. <laughs> they just keep getting worse. <laughs> Follow us on the dark web. <laughs> if you're looking for like uh, Estonian small arms, we have an account there. <laughs> we <laughs> that's how we make the podcast profitable. All the money's gone by Patreon, but uh, you can actually sell uh, weapons to the Ukraine conflict for healthy profits through the dark web, which yeah. is what we're going to be talking about. On yeah, this episode. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. So uh, on April 13 of this uh, year, 2018, uh, Trump launched uh, more than 100 cruise missiles uh, at government targets in Syria. Uh, Hooray. Many of those were Tomahawk uh, cruise missiles, which were Ooh, ma- cultural appropriation. <laughs> <laughs> it's representation, I love, okay? <laughs> I do love that like the, the the woke take would be like, well they got to change the name of the <laughs> missile. <laughs> like uh, I mean, listen, bombing people it's a little iffy, but naming it the N-word, I mean, come on. Like I mean, what are we really talking about? Here? I do love they the idea. They should at least take the Indians logo off the missiles. <laughs> They have the Chief Wahoo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do love the idea of like a woke protester confronting Obama. Like, how dare you blow up children with tomahawk <laughs> missiles? <laughs> they should be called uh, A-37s or something <laughs> non-offensive sounding. Um, but yeah, so it's been noted other places. Sure, you've heard it. Tomahawk missiles. The U.S. government buys them for about one point five million dollars each. Indigenous people missiles. <laughs> yes. Let's let's be fair here. Yes, indigenous um, hatchet missiles. And they're uh, manufactured by Raytheon. So now the Pentagon shot off those missiles. They'll have to buy replacements. It's a payday. Raytheon stock goes up. Uh, a lot of people have noticed this. And um, so we'll we'll cover you know. Uh, the, the weapons industry, it's a big industry, unsurprisingly, but uh, according to Bloomberg, 
Well, uh, Bloomberg, are, there, there's the big five, essentially, as far as the U.S. weapons industry goes. That's Lockheed Martin, Boeing, General Dynamics, Raytheon, and Northup Grumman. And we'll cover a bit of them, uh, particularly Raytheon, Lockheed. Um, but we, we won't get to everything because it would take forever. Um, but essentially, these people are the people who get these major billion-some dollar contracts from the Pentagon um, and are what Eisenhower described as the military-industrial con- complex. Incidentally, the Pentagon also has... Five sides. <laughs> <laughs> um, How did you guys not see that coming? <laughs> a naked guy shot some people today. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, Waffle House. You guys House. hear about this? Waffle House? Some of the Waffle, the Waffle House? House? You seen this, Kev? Yeah, he, uh, he lined the women up against the wall, Kev. And he said, uh, this is for all the girls who rejected me. What is his voice? <laughs> this man, he was, uh, he was shooting people up in the Waffle House. Uh, little did you know that uh, uh, they're, they're like, he shot up naked, but that's actually uh, standard attire in the Waffle House. <laughs> Very confused. <laughs> uh, I was trying to uh, do a, a Tonight Show band thing. Oh, you were doing Jay Leno? That yeah. was your Leno? Well, it was my uh, murdering clown, Jay Leno. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. That makes more sense. All I right. thought you were doing I like... I did a the, pretty good imitation of a Jay Leno. I, I thought you were doing Leno. the gingerbread man from Shrek. <laughs> and I was like, what <laughs> the <laughs> fuck is this all about? It was less yeah. Leno, more more fable Leno. Uh, uh, did you hear this about uh, Princess Diana? <laughs> good. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, anyways, the point is uh, the um, the, uh, weapons industry, there's a lot of different aspects, but one aspect is small arms, guns, bullets, these kinds of things. So as much as gun sales are a huge proponent of the profits of these industries, gun sales are not nearly as profitable as the uh, amount of money they make off of bullets. Mm -hmm. And the thing is is that uh, when you look up who makes bullets for the U.S. military – uh, according to Shane Christian, U.S. Army Special Forces and combat dri- diver, there's only been one major supplier of small arms ammunition to the military since World War II, Lake City Army Ammunition. It has a government-owned facility and has been managed by three companies only, Remington, Olin, and ATK. Hmm. And in 2005, due to shortage, they had a limited second supplier of General Dynamics Ordnance. Um, due, due to a shortage caused by um, the murder of Iraqi children. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're running out of bullets, you know? <laughs> we need some more bullets. They take all the Marines aside, and they're like, look, uh, after you rape their mothers, you can only put 10 bullets in them <laughs> instead of <laughs> instead of 15. I love how I've been scolded several times. <laughs> no, this really happened. I know I, it's a horrible thing, but there have been multiple incidents. Well, maybe don't smile while you say it, John. <laughs> look, humor is how we deal with the horrible things in life. I wouldn't just make this up. I wouldn't just... You would make this up. (laughs) (laughs) I know you, Sean. Anyway, so... You guys, the Iraq occupation was one of the most humane in history. (laughs) And at no point did commanders on the ground lie about material events, (laughs) such as house-to-house murders and uh, sexual assaults. Go on, Yogi. Get the all great clip out. So Lake that City, was sanctions. It was a completely different, more justified kind of genocide. Are, are, are we done with that, guys? Are we? <laughs> uh, Lake City Army Ammunition is a plant in uh, Independence, Missouri. I love the name of the sound. It lets you know that uh, the only thing they're exporting is bullets, and the only thing they're importing is pain. Um, it uh, basically every year they make 1.4 billion rounds of ammunition. I, and it is uh, crazy how much money they make for off of small arms. Because, you know, you might charge... It's the same thing with cars and gas. Like, it's uh, a real bait and switch. Same thing with restaurants with food and drinks like Steve and I were talking about earlier today. I mean, the fact is is that the small arms is what the, is how they make the most of their money. Because, you know, to make it, it's just, you know, a little bit of lead, a little bit of... Munitions. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's sad, really, because uh, they make a killing... Off bullet sales. Nay. Ah, that that's a New York Post headline right there. Yes, yes, it is. Um, and about twenty five percent of their workforce is former military. So mm. basically, if you're the like ammunition's lead, of, you'll you'll see that's a common theme throughout this podcast. Right, right. And it is it, former it, government, former military are usually able to get private sector defense jobs for some reason. I mean, it makes sense because like a regular civilian would eventually be like, I don't want to keep making these weapons of mass destruction for the government, but people in the military, 
uh, have been brainwashed to believe killing them makes us stronger, and so of course they do their job diligently. I'd like to see like open competition for small arms, like a, just open bidding <laughs> for small arms. Like they have to start like this one's got a blue stripe on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the free market at work. The thing we is, were we, we were joking earlier though. If what if Westlake uh, Arms Manufacturers was based in Seattle, Lake City, yeah, Lake City Arms Manufacturers based in Seattle, and there was like a bunch of hipsters, like uh, yeah, I don't really shop at Starbucks. <laughs> it's too corporate. <laughs> Anyways, I'm gonna make my new sheet of uh, M4A1 <laughs> ammunition. This is artisanal <laughs> munitions. <laughs> We're like a we're like a, a real small arms <laughs> distributor, <laughs> not like those corporate. Yeah, support you buy the tokens here and then... <laughs> on Small Business Day. You go and like buy like ammunition from like a mom and pop shop. Well, if you look up pictures of this company, it's all like late fifties, early sixties white guys in um, like cut off jean shorts. Yeah, and like <laughs> loading like, in weapons, right? And like way too large safety goggles, like that. <laughs> Like atypical factory employee, uh, Heartland Mill America. If we don't do the job, they will type of thing. And a lot of patches that are kind of blurred out, red <laughs> rectangles <laughs> with kind of a blue X in them. Uh, You're hardworking uh, Americans. Uh, Are you disrespecting me? <laughs> um, so the waste treatment of, of these facilities is usually on site, and they use like landfills and burn pits and unlined lagoons. And a lot of these uh, facilities have hazardous waste and hazardous substances, including solvents, oils, greases, explosives, radionuclides, percolates, and heavy metals. As a result of the extensive contamination, the site was added to the United States Environmental Protection Agency National Priorities List in 1987. And it remains a super fun site to this day. Mm. So basically... Did you say super fun? Yeah. Nice. It remains a super fun super place fun to place hang out. Yeah. Great place to take your kids. It's got water slides. Yeah. They put a playground on it. There's no water, though. Just bullet casings. Yeah. You got to slide into them. It's kind of like a, the the duck, the, the mix Scrooge with the gold the pits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Bullets. But, but with bullets, yeah. yes. Mm. Um, there was a tragedy because somebody shot the no smoking sign. <laughs> 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 Several children were blown apart. I mean, so, like, you know, a, a lot of these companies are, are making money out of the ass because of these bullets. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, we rarely talk about bullet control, but Chris Rock was right. We don't need gun control. We need bullet control. Bullets should cost $5,000 a piece. What's that other bit he did? There's two kinds of black people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Andy, how'd that go? Yeah, Andy, what was that bit about? So, uh... Andy can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so then, Stephen, you kind of looked into the NRA... On the other hand, there's two sides of small arms, obviously. There's uh, there's the bullets, and then there's the things they come out of. Right. <laughs> well, and there's the also the very effective marketing campaign, which is make people terrified of the government, which is why they need to buy guns and bullets to protect themselves from the government. Right. Yeah. And Chomsky made the interesting observation that, of course, this terror from the gover against the government is kind of ironic, considering it's the only branch of power that is at least somewhat accountable to the public, whereas corporate America has almost unlimited power and has no accountability right. to the public. So, you know, it's like, these are the people polluting your fucking neighborhood and, you know, dropping bombs on kids uh, in foreign countries. Uh, well, the government's doing that, but they're the ones selling them the fucking bombs. Right. And to defend yourself, buy our guns as well. Right. Well, we'll give it to you, actually, so that you can tell people to buy these guns that we're giving you. Mm-hmm. You know, after the Parkland massacre, um, the flip side of that fear campaign is like actually there was a backlash this time with the high school students. And yes, uh, the the Remington company actually had to file for bankruptcy mm. in part due to companies pulling out of uh, marketing their their wares. Right. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Delta Airlines canceled their "Bring Your Rifle to <laughs> <laughs> You can no bring your rifle bring... to Orlando program. <laughs> they actually ban rifles on airlines now. Because of this, did they? Before you could, <laughs> before you could. Yeah, yeah it's the one of the old. I think it's the almost the oldest arms manufacturer in yeah, the Remington. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, and like the other thing is like a lot of these companies have seen their sales go down under Trump, like small arms manufacturers, because during the Obama years, uh, a lot of right wing groups were like able to fear monger off the idea that Obama was coming to take your guns away. Yeah, and you know, of course, he didn't. 
but they were able to sell weapons off that. And then with Trump, you know, there's not really much of a worry. So now they have to go like Black Lives Matter is going to fucking kill you in your home, right, right. which is why you need a, a tactical AR-15. And it's crazy how there's like both the conspiracy and the genuine truth that the one way to stop that the government is going to kill you. Yes, of course. <laughs> well, that's already happening. But uh, that like to get um to stop this amount of hatred that it comes with gun ownership is to get more black gun owners. Like that's yeah, one of the conspiracies. Yeah. It's oh, like that's right. That just like that idea of a strategy is like, yeah, you know, that's going <laughs> to shut down the NRA, right? Or shut down gun, gu- like get us gun regulations. Is if a bunch of black people buy guns, it's like that's you're kind of making it like. That was like one of the most ingenious NRA marketing executives. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, black Americans, you need to buy guns <laughs> to stop this. From my cold, dead hands. <laughs> what if that were like an NRA membership like uh, bonus? Like if you Quote donate Charlton enough Heston. money. No, you get to like buy a gun and then pull it from Charlton Heston's cold, dead hands. <laughs> That's so easy, is it? <laughs> Interesting. Anyway, point. congratulations. Yeah, uh, and and uh, some, most of our listeners, well, some of our listeners might be familiar with this. This kind of went around as a meme, but essentially, when Reagan was governor of California in 1967, uh, the Black Panthers were open carrying weapons near the California mm-hmm. State House, and then uh, both Reagan signed and the NRA supported a bill to ban open carrying in yeah. public. So there is some merit to the argument that uh, black people with guns are. But uh, that's the thing, though. It like it kind of works, like what you're mentioning. But then also, it's a conspiracy because it makes you know racist white gun owners be like, "Oh, I need to own more guns." Black people are gonna st- are owning guns too. Does that make sense? Like the conspiracy is black civilians will own guns to take out white gun owners, and white gun owners believe the hatred so much that they think I need to own more guns. Right. Well, that was the other NRA propaganda campaign telling black Americans to hold their guns sideways so they couldn't. <laughs> Aim as well. And well, that's how we'll win the, what, the race right. war. That's well, that right. kind of goes into the history of the NRA, which is that uh, it, it started out as like a rifle safety or gun mm-hmm. safety organization. Mm-hmm. And then over the years, it sort of uh, transformed, especially under Wayne LaPierre, into a uh, gun manufacturer's lobbying organization. Hell yeah. And yeah, it's like click it or ticket advocating drunk driving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I guess, um, uh, well, I could talk a bit about Raytheon, but uh, do we want to talk about Yemen in general? Or well, I, I was thinking that okay, so we've got we've got weapons manufacturers in America. We've got the small they're basically arms pumping money into uh, the NRA to get the NRA, and the NRA kind of then pumps money into politicians, so that politicians don't necessarily have to take money directly from gun manufacturers, mm-hmm. uh, but they probably do that too through their PACs. Um, and that, in turn, you know, you basically buy off politicians to get them to uh, fiercely uh, oppose any kind of gun restrictions. And ultimately, what it comes back to is the money for the gun manufacturers. And uh, so there's there's that element of it in terms of weapon manufacturers. And then well, I, I was thinking we could take a step up now and talk about weapons manufacturers on the military side one, of things. One more thing on the small arms terror thing. It is like one of the most short-sighted strategies in history is uh, the small government people encouraging uh, all of their constituents to be heavily armed and then attempting to end all of the entitlement programs that are keeping them alive. <laughs> right. It's like, Jesus Christ, I wonder what will happen when uh, you try to take health care away from your heavily armed constituency. Uh, you're going to need a few more bodyguards at your baseball game. Or cutting cutting back on teacher funding and also trying to arm teachers right. at the same time. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> God, you know, at least they're always looking for new markets. All right, well, so I guess we'll we'll go from small arms manufacturers to the more macro, which is, as we mentioned, the Big Five, Lockheed, Boeing, General Dynamics, Raytheon, Northup Grumman. These are the people who supply both the Pentagon, our NATO allies, but also, you know, countries like Saudi Arabia, um, Singapore, uh, all sorts of different uh, nations of varying degrees of, um, let's say, human rights respecting. Uh, but all, but so like Boeing, human wrongs. 
Uh, Boeing's interesting because Boeing is of those different in that they make the majority of their money from commercial airplane sales, you know, selling their Boeing aircraft. But whereas the others, like in the case of Raytheon, 90% of their money comes from defense contracts from governments, I believe 67% of which is from the U.S. federal government. And it's uh, similar with Lockheed Martin, where the vast majority of their um, of their funding is, based, is to government entities. Mm-hmm. You know my favorite porn star, Cockheed Martin? It's really good. It's got a lot of gun bandolier <laughs> tattoos. He fucks with the passion of the American military. Uh, yeah, Lockheed Martin makes 85% of its money from uh, U.S. contracts and 13% from foreign governments. And then other contracts is 2%. And uh, as we'll talk about a bit, this creates... Very perverse incentives, but also makes these corporations spend a lot on lobbying. Like Lockheed, for example, according to Open Secrets, has spent uh, between five and eight million approximately every year on lobbying since 2006. And they also very much have a revolving door where they hire former government and Pentagon officials. And then, you know, in the case of Trump, uh, they appoint the Lockheed executives or um, Raytheon lobbyists to uh, government positions uh, when they come in you know, who will actually have, you know, uh, control over the government procurement and budgeting process and then, you know, <laughs> go hire their former companies to get these contracts. Right. So and it's all fucked up. Lockheed's particularly interesting, um, or Lockheed Martin. It was originally a Lockheed company which uh, made a lot of Cold War planes like the SR-17 Blackbird, which uh, had that hit in 2000 right now. Uh, the C-130 <laughs> Hercules, uh, Polaris submarine, uh, launched ballistic missiles. Uh, so They hired Martin Lawrence. They too. hired My- Martin Lawrence, uh, and then they merged with Martin Marionetta, which was known for uh, Titan ballistic missile ICBMs. Uh, notably, there was one that blew up in its silo in, oh in God, 1980. Really? Cause, yeah, because a maintenance person dropped a fucking wrench that just <laughs> fell down and knocked, like, a cord out or a hole and then it started leaking rocket fuel and nine hours later the whole silo blew up <laughs> and fortunately the warhead uh didn't go off but i think unfortunately <laughs> yeah it it was near like a major um i forget where but it was near a major metropolitan area oh my god um literally a wrench was thrown into the works <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's fucking crazy yeah it was like they had like you know these 20 something air force guys like you know doing their routine right, maintenance right. and one of them just dropped a wrench and yeah the thing blew up and there was a there's an interesting documentary of it where there's like a senator who finds out about it and he's like so do i tell my fan because he's like just <laughs> near it <laughs> Yeah, he's like, so so should I get out of here? Like what? Uh, yeah, what, what, yeah, yeah, he's right. like, uh, yeah. And so, wow, what a piece of shit. So, uh, those two companies merged and formed Lockheed Martin, which is uh, run very heavily on government contracts. And uh, if I could just interrupt, Lockheed's number one. Like of the big five, Lockheed does the most in business, I believe. In yes. the world, right? Uh, at least with the U.S. government, but probably globally, too, yeah. And Cockheed Martin also is globally recognized as one of the best porn stars. Just want to get that out there. Oh, and incidentally, in between 1950 and 1970, it was later found, uh, I think from the Church Commission, that Lockheed had been paying foreign officials $22 million in bribes for them oh, to buy yeah. their products. And oh yeah, Raytheon has bribery scandals too. Like this is happens all the time. Yeah, and it 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 led That's to crazy. the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act banning that practice. Like right. the, they're literally selling weapons, but they're like, well, we're not doing this good enough. Can we start bribing people to buy our shit? Yeah, well, yeah. interestingly enough, like the Foreign uh, Corrupt Practices Act is one of the good things to come out of Watergate. Um, but in the United Kingdom, at least a few years ago, there was no comparable law. So what would happen was there was a frontline documentary on this where um, I think it was BAE lobbyists. I might be wrong, but uh, essentially a British manufacturer would uh, they would fly, you know, Saudi princes and yep. other influential people in the government into the United Kingdom and then just give them like a platinum all expenses paid credit card and just let them run up whatever the <laughs> fuck tab they want. <laughs> and then, of course, these people would go back to Saudi Arabia and then their government would buy the weapons from right. this British uh, defense contractor because there was no equivalent law and of course u.s companies do this kind of bribery too but they have to be much more sneaky about it sure sure give them gift cards instead of credit cards (laughs) (laughs) that's nuts yeah 
Yeah. Um, but uh, you want to go on with Lockheed, or I can talk about Raytheon a bit. Um, yeah. I so mean, what what Lockheed's most known for now is the F thirty five. Hell yes. Which is the next generation of American fighter jets, and the term fighter jet is is kind of you get the idea that you get a sort of top gun uh you spin around in the sky and then shoot a little homing missile at uh mig uh the reality of most fighter jets is uh has kind of been kind of like revealed recently and what i'm going to talk about later the yemen conflict where f-16s also a lockheed property are used basically to uh bomb people in Yemen, who are coming home from the store, basically just to bomb civilians in Yemen uh, for the purposes of bombing them into submit. But it's it, there aren't really dog fights any. So anyway, for the purposes of teaching them to buy halal products only. <laughs> yeah. So, so apparently uh, Lockheed Martin and the United States government decided they needed a next generation of bombing. Uh, peasants on the ground and so the f-35 the next generation is they remove the ability to land (laughs) yeah (laughs) it uh it notoriously it's a stealth aircraft Mm -hmm. uh it notoriously has trouble flying in thunderstorms it costs a hundred million dollars per plane and has a 1.5 trillion dollar lifetime cost uh, and also, apparently, it has a for bunch the, of software for the program, issues. right? For like the program, they've, yeah. They've spent more than like a hun- one point five trillion without even like delivering an airplane, right? Like a functional, right? It, they know. claim it's one point five trillion lifetime cost. So right. I don't know if it's it might have been like. But a they're trillion, wasting so money on a plane we don't even fucking need. They're spending more like than a trillion on, you know, like a plane that is constantly fucking up in the development cycle and has had huge cost overruns. Right, but like you mentioned, they don't even dogfight anymore. They're not fighting right. other planes. No, they no, just like, bomb the grocery store. Oh yeah, God. yeah. The concept That's... is just like, you know, well, what if... What if what we if... go to war with China? Or... Yeah, China. And they have... And obviously, we already spend more money than the next six countries combined in military right. reserves. And also, if we went to war with China, it would be the end of civilization because we would all launch our ballistic missiles. Right. Uh, but uh, then, on the other hand, uh, Lockheed can get you a nice hotel... And uh, they're oh, and also they're based on literally an air force base. They their, That's their base. headquarter. Yeah, it's an air force base outside of Fort Worth, Texas. That's the thing that's crazy is they're not even subtle about like like yeah. Independence, Missouri, being where they make the the bullets. Like it's like fuck you. At least try and be like, uh, no, nah, we're we're Harrodsville. Like try yeah. and not be so straight up. Uh, you know, in the dick of the military. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's just straight up like yep yeah, these are this is our lunch this is what, our... what you said about them being kind of superfluous in an actual con like global conflict that they were sort of designed for yeah like uh i, th- I think it was gorbachev who was um in a discussion on like he said he would go into meetings with, where they would plan out war like possible war potentialities uh-huh and they were telling about like well, we have this many tanks ready to go in case of... And he was just... <laughs> he would say he was just basically just weeping for all of them. They'd just be incinerated because the, the conflict would escalate to nuclear. Yeah, but, soon, like, but what immediately. If, what if yeah. we do one of those wars where everybody follows the rules? <laughs> <laughs> you know all those wars we've had throughout history where people <laughs> enter into agreements to not use nuclear weapons and then don't? Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing probably, and this is just pure speculation, part of it is just like they want something that's a little more stealth in case an insurgency gets slightly more sophisticated cold war level like uh anti-aircraft technology i don't know i mean like that seems true but it's also just the military budget is always ever increasing so that there can be a larger military budget oh yeah yeah. And this plane is a perfect example of overspending on something that is not needed Mm -hmm. today and potentially tomorrow and I mean, it's literally like, you know, hey, how many chairs do we need for the event? Probably 40. Well, let's get 80 just in case. It's like, well, we don't need 80 chairs, but I guess I'll do what you say, boss. Well, yeah. Like, if you actually want to learn something, you should listen to Chomsky talk about this. If you want to hear 
four guys sticking around, you should keep <laughs> listening to this podcast. But Chomsky, the way solid, he put, solid sell, Chomsky. <laughs> uh, Chomsky, the way he put it was essentially the defense budget is a subsidy to the defense industry. It's a government subsidy to the defense industry, and you can see why that is because uh, the sequester that Obama put in place that they thought would never happen did actually happen only in 2013. Sean means sequester. Sequester. No, he meant Ryan Seacrest. Go right. <laughs> but essentially, they put this thing in place to stop the growth of uh, military spending uh, and cut it back very uh, modestly. And it only happened in 2013. And then every other year, they're like, no, 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 we're not going to do this. We need to keep giving all the big five money. And again, the big five, as we mentioned, uh, they... We, we mentioned actually before we started, the big five, according to Bloomberg, have outperformed the S&P 500 uh, for the last uh, between 2013 and 2017. And that's a, been a good year for the stock market. So the defense contractors have been doing great. And again, most of their business comes from government contracts, particularly the Pentagon. And part of the idea is that basically the free market, when left to its own devices, is incredibly unstable. And the United States government learned this during the Great Depression when it all kind of fell apart, when it was largely unregulated. So part of what they do is they just want to pump money into uh, the economy. And the the Chomsky argument, at least in understanding power, is that they, they have two options to do that. Um, and technically it's called like Keynesian spending. Uh, one option would be to pump money into social services and create a better social state. And that money would kind of stabilize capitalism. And Lame. The reason, and the reason that the U.S. doesn't do that is because social services affect people very directly. And so then people would have a more democratic say in things because that's something that, you know, is uh, present in many facets of their lives. So then the government more directly decided to pump money into the military, which will have the same kind of stimulus or Keynesian stimulus effect. But because the um, the populace of the United States isn't like doesn't interact with the military in their day to day lives, right. they uh, would exercise less influence on how that money is spent, where that money is spent. There's less public oversight. And on top of that, you can then build up your military to have sort of a stronger control on like, you know, international trade. You get a little leg up in negotiations when you got these, you know, F-35s. And uh, that's... Uh, Let's get, here. let's get Chomsky on sometime before he dies in the next year. <laughs> yeah, I'll send him a letter. The other, the other argument I've heard about is how, like, you know, when you want to cut down military spending, the biggest argument is, like, that would uh, take away jobs the from jobs. people. Jobs. Oh, yeah. There's a Can't forget the jobs. There's a beautiful uh, clip from CNN. Uh, I think it was from 2016. With, Hell, yes. Uh, Rand Paul. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. Just, you Wolf know. Wolf Pulitzer doing adversarial journalism. Yeah, yeah. Rand Paul... Talking about the only thing that he's right about, which is weapons distribution, he was like, we need to cut down on weapon sales, like to Saudi Arabia, and Wolf Blitzer goes, well, if, if we cut down on weapon sales, won't that, won't that hurt American jobs? Wow. What a snake, Wolf. What a snake. Look, how are people going to feed their families if they're, taking away the, if they're not taking <laughs> away the breadwinners in other families? <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah, so uh, we've mentioned a bit about lobbying, just kind of like a um, uh, 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 headline here. Uh, there was a Bloomberg article that I think was pretty interesting. Um, before we get to that, you guys ever shoot a gun before? Y'all shoot guns? Mm-hmm. Uh, I never have. I really Steven, want to. Sean hasn't. Andy, about you? Yeah, I shot, uh, I shot 22s in Boy Scouts and then shotguns. You shot 22 Scouts. boys? Yeah. He, that, he shot 22 yeah. boys. Oh. Yeah. That was just his That's jizz. a merit badge. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you, that's how you that's how you become a life scout. I shot guns a handful of times. Shotgun M sixteen and uh, oh yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I got you're the one I least expected to have shot guns. Actually. You know what? I uh, I've shot more guns than more, most people would expect. Uh, mm-hmm. Mostly because I don't trust anyone, <laughs> um, and I have enough money to potentially buy a gun. Uh, it goes hand in hand. When you have money to buy a gun, you think about buying one more often than Yogi, other people would. Next time you go to a gun range, you should grow out your full beard and just be <laughs> like, uh, "Hey, wait a minute!" Before um, just whip out a prayer rug. <laughs> 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 like, uh, sorry, which way faces Mecca? I gotta, I gotta make sure I get this right. You know, the first time I went to a gun range, I was with two of my friends, and uh, we were shooting together. So uh, one person would shoot, and then like uh, another person would stand next to him, and then the third person would stand behind him. Mm-hmm. And when two of my friends were shooting, I saw a guy. Uh, Yogi's he, from from uh, Bellevue, which for those who don't know is 
Microsoft headquarters is surrounded by gun ranges. Yes, right. that's correct. They've got to train themselves so, for the what? uprising of the proletariat. Andy's surprisingly <laughs> spot on by that description. Uh, I lived there for half a year. One of, my, one of my closest friends growing up uh, is what I will uh, lovingly call a redneck Jew. He uh, is both Jewish, but his parents also grew up in the South. So I did a lot of things. Like the first time I ever went to a concert, it was a Primus concert with him. But before <laughs> that, we went to the Van Gogh exhibit at Sam. So it's a very beautiful relationship I have with this guy. So I shot a lot of guns with this friend of mine. And um, so when I was there, I, when I was at the gun range, they were shooting at, at the range. And then I saw a guy walk up and he had a full trench coat on and he had the target all the way as close as you could have it. And he would yell, murder, and then shoot around, murder, and then shoot another round. And I'm the only one witnessing this because everyone else has the ear protection and they're focusing on their own target. And I'm like, how is this guy allowed to be here right yeah. now? How are you allowed to just yell murder at the top of your lungs with the target as close as you can get it to? Not death, not surprise, murder. That's the thing. <laughs> Buddy, we get what you're doing. You're literally shooting a gun. That sounds like someone who was touched by an uncle. and uh... That popular ABC program. <laughs> or the holder of Raytheon call options. <laughs> <laughs> so, like... Uh... I mentioned the lobbying thing, but like uh, all the big five and other arms manufacturers do this, where like not only do they spend the money directly lobbying, but they hire uh, former Pentagon, former uh, government officials. And the Trump administration has really taken this to another level. Uh, just from a Bloomberg article, Mark Esper, the current Army, sec- Army Secretary, is a uh, Raytheon lobbyist for more than a decade, I think 20 years, but. Uh, more than a decade spent as a Raytheon lobbyist. He's now the Army Secretary. Uh, John Rood has had a R O O D has had an interesting career. He was um, interestingly enough, he was George W. Bush's Under Secretary of State for Arms Control, and then after he left, he went to work for Raytheon. And then with Trump coming back, he uh, was also a Lockheed executive. And now with Trump coming back, he is the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. Um, And then uh, they quote Elizabeth Warren here on the Senate floor. She says, quote, the deputy secretary of defense was previously a senior vice president at Boeing. This is the current deputy secretary of defense. The deep state, deep state is bad. (laughs) Really bad. Uh, They're really trying to take down the Trump administration, this deep state. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, he's really an enemy of them. But so his name is Pat Shanahan and uh, Elizabeth Warren continues. Pat Shanahan. His, he now runs the Pentagon's budget process, including making the final call on which defense programs get funding and which do not. Oh, I think uh, old Pat Shanahan here thinks we should uh, uh, re- uh, renew our contract uh, for the F-45 and give them an extra trillion dollars to really get their uh, their missiles going. Aye. Aye. It's good <laughs> but, crack, uh, isn't it? But uh, so like uh, just uh, and we could go on forever. Richard Armitage is a former U.S. Deputy deputy Ooh, Richard Secre- Armitage. <laughs> Deputy Secretary of State. He was hired for, by Raytheon for consultancy work. Um, uh, Raytheon's hired former CIA directors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Looks like I... the kingpin. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, uh, the new head of the DEA, uh, El Chapo Guzman. <laughs> <laughs> but you can has see has negotiated a contract. <laughs> Uh, but you can see why, like, Raytheon uh, takes in, I think, in 2017, they took in $25.3 billion in revenues. Again, when 67% of that is coming from the U.S. federal government, they have an incentive to hire government, former government employees and spend money lobbying them. So you can see why this could pervert the war-making system that we have set right. up in this country. And that's what's crazy is that like we're literally going to war so people can make money more than we're going to war so that we can fight injustices. Mm-hmm. More yeah. injustices like too many brown people. <laughs> <laughs> also, incidentally, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, uh, and I think Boeing, too, spend a lot of money on Twitter ads. Hell yes. And Twitter has an interesting policy that is you cannot advocate violence <laughs> unless it's state violence. Uh, what? That's wonderful. Yeah, the caveat is like you can't advocate. The a- caveat so, is it I can't can be- tweet, hey, everyone punch Andy Palmer, but I can tweet, let's bomb Assad. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, what yeah, a, yeah. What a, Jack, you fucked up. <laughs> well, if Andy, were, if Andy visited Syria, you could advocate to yeah. bomb him. 
Andy, it's, you, you can only Andy, advocate just, for violence against me if it's government violence. That's crazy. Yeah. Why is that the loophole? Just because of this nonsense? Because they want uh, these companies to buy ads? I mean, I, I don't think it's inconsequential. <laughs> <laughs> There's a fuck ton of Raytheon and Lockheed Martin ads on Twitter. Especially every time it's International Women's Day and Raytheon's on Twitter <laughs> highlighting <laughs> female engineers. Uh, women in STEM? Yes. Yeah, women in yeah. STEM. And uh, uh, there's also like a, a Northup Grumman commercial we watched a while ago, but uh, man, I'll link it on the Tumblr. It's called Dreamers. And so it displays a perfect uh, multi ethnic group of children, uh, multi all genders, all racist. Of course, of course. And they were throwing a football around like, you know, multi ethnic groups of children do. Of course. Uh-huh. And then one of them. In their sandlot. Yes. One of them throws it over a fence where oh, they're darn. where it lands next to a barking dog oh, who seems very angry and scary, and uh, he represents the Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, just like in the Sandlot, <laughs> and and so one of the girls in this group puts on a cloaking device. <laughs> And then sneaks in to take the football back from the dog Muslims. Like a green beret. And then brings it back to the group. And they're all happy. And then it cuts to this little girl as an older woman working to design the Northup Grumman B-21 <laughs> stealth bomber. I can, I can imagine that the catcher from Sandlot, as well as Smalls, get enlisted. But the catcher's like a ground force. And Smalls ends up working at one of those drone farms <laughs> and there's just a mix up in the targeting and so the drone <laughs> starts doing some friendly fire and the last thing you hear the catcher say is like you're killing me smalls <laughs> sorry the b2 bomber my bad um who made that commercial again north op uh at one point we'll release a segment where we release youtube videos of us critiquing those commercials that'd be fun oh, yeah, yeah. yeah there's a lot of great like I mean, it is funny how woke woke politics, woke culture, performative, whatever you want to call it, has infiltrated everything where you have, like, literally merchants of death being like, yeah, we promote women in STEM. <laughs> right, right. Well, if you, go to, if you go to the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., one of the things there is just they have a drone hanging in, like, their newest area with, like, on the camera is a very prominent Raytheon logo. And it's also the plaque in the Air and Space Museum that mentions 9-11 the most. Oh, my <laughs> uh, Which, you know, you'd think they'd also put that next to the 757s, but... I mean, that's not the only drone above D.C., but we're not going to talk <laughs> about that right now. Um, I guess, do we want to talk about Yemen? Because we can mention the Saudi yeah. Arabia contract. Uh, yeah, so, basically, this is one thing that's been kind of... Uh, I don't, just on my mind a lot because it's very Aww. rarely in in the news and especially with a lot of what's going on in Syria now where there's uh, always a news alert when Assad drops a barrel bomb on people or, uh, you know, a gas attack in Syria, which obviously those are horrible. I don't um, think so. Sean doesn't think so. <laughs> They're all Al-Qaeda, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I read Phil Greaves' Twitter. So that's a big deal. Um but at the same time, Assad is uh, adversarial to the United States, as is Russia, who is allied with Assad, and I think Iran is somewhere in the mix there too. Now, contrast studied the conflict. Con- <laughs> Shut the fuck up, Sean. Contrasted <laughs> with this is in Yemen, where in I, I believe it was 2014 or 2015, uh, Houthi rebels came from northern Yemen. They're kind of Shia-associated rebels. They came down to Sana'a, took Sana'a, and... The capital of Yemen. The capital of Yemen. And they, uh, in that process, Saudi Arabia uh, sort of started to, and the United States, identify the Houthi rebels as associated with Iran, uh, mostly because the Houthi rebels were Shia and Iran's a Shia theocracy. And so... Saudi Arabia then decided to stage an intervention, including, uh, I believe, a ground invasion and a very fierce air campaign uh, against the Houthi rebels. And what what that ultimately turned into was a campaign against the people in Houthi-controlled territory. Uh, Part of this was just a serial bombing campaign where they would bomb they would bomb funerals. uh, They would bomb funerals for people killed in funerals. It, uh, they also bombed a lot of sanitation areas. They uh, also instituted in the UN a blockade to, quote-unquote, keep weapons away from the rebels. 
Uh, this this blockade was also agreed on by uh, the United States. Uh, and the idea, but the one of the results of this blockade is that they also kept food out of Yemen, which is a country that relies on ninety uh, percent of its food to be imported. And so, what happened as a result was mass starvation. Uh, the conflict is still going on. There have been millions of people who have been starving. The UN reported that there were ten thousand deaths in twenty fifteen. And they haven't been able to update that number because Saudi Arabia has been bombing like hospitals and all these institutional buildings that would be used to count deaths. So they can't get an accurate death toll, but it's probably much more. It's closer to like 100,000 by now. Uh, on top of that, uh, over a million people have cholera uh, because Saudi Arabia destroyed sanitation in Houthi controlled areas. Uh, and on top of that, it's known that Saudi Arabia will also target food production within Yemen. Like there are reports of Saudi Arabian attack helicopters just going after fishermen and just like flying in and like just They're shooting up fishermen. Very militant vegetarians in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, as well as bombing farms. Apparently there's been, there's a, um, they, they don't allow reporters into Yemen and so uh, it's hard to also get an on the floor or on the ground uh, kind of uh, reporting on what's going on. But there is a journalist who's in Yemen, and I'll have his name in a second. Uh, but he's basically said that for the last three years or so that he's lived in Sana'a, he cannot remember a day that it hasn't been bombed. Right. Yeah. And so essentially what you have is the Saudi Arabia is targeting the civilians of Yemen, largely because I believe they want to make it a client state because uh, a Houthi-controlled state isn't going to be a puppet to uh, a Sunni state right. like Saudi Arabia. And so they want to basically bomb them into submission, make them into a client state. And the way that they're carrying it out is a genocide because they're systemically starving the people. They're uh, destroying all of their water cleaning um you know uh and not only solutions. that you know the the leader of the Houthis uh Darius Rucker uh is a uh also American singer and songwriter uh he uh lead vocalist and rhythm guitarist of the Grammy award winning American rock band uh, Houthi and the Glo- Blowfish um you know they've got six top 40 hits on the Billboard Hot 100 uh Rucker co-wrote the majority of the band's song as well as bombed these fishermen <laughs> Andy, so. you said you'd make the genocide summary funny. <laughs> I tried. Yeah. Yogi's bailing you out, just like the U.S. is bailing out Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Yeah, so it's it's well reported that in these bombings, the U.S. has, and this started under Obama, refueled uh, a lot of Saudi jets. Now, here the, the, the big kicker of this is, if you look up the Saudi uh, military, especially their air force or um, any any their planes that are associated with their army it's all bought from english and american companies right like the i mentioned earlier there were bombings of people coming home from a shop by f-16s the uh, attack helicopters were likely the that shot um people who were uh the fishermen were likely either apache or blackhawk uh apache is built by boeing Black Hawk is built by Lockheed Martin. Uh, BA they also, Systems, too. Yeah. BA Systems, yeah. And well, Bell and it, it is be another noted, one that makes Hueys. You might have heard the, the news story about Trump signing this $110 billion arms deal with Saudi Arabia. Um, so about $7 billion of that is uh, from so-called precision munitions from Raytheon and Boeing. So, again, yes. this is like when they can't get enough money from the Pentagon, they sell to Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia uses it for their genocidal campaigns in Yemen. And on top of that, uh, basically the idea is that uh, Saudi Arabia is trying to buy smart bombs from the United States, which is to uh, or tools from Boeing that Boeing openly advertises on their website to convert, quote, dumb bombs into smart bombs. Mm-hmm. And they're basically these fins that you just stick on bombs that have uh, GPS targeting and it's so that you don't have, quote, more civilian casualties. The effect of it... <laughs> the, the smart bombs watch Rachel Maddow before they blow up a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's been done to death, but come on, people. <laughs> the uh, ultimate effect is that, uh, for example, when there were there was the bombing of the... Um, what was it? 
the uh, funeral in Saudi Arabia, one of the things that the people who were bombed described was hearing the whistling and then course correcting of a smart bomb as it oh, came wow. down to hit their funeral. And it was ultimately they like people investigated the bomb. There was they a heard Alexa bomb. right before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they also heard this. <laughs> Oh, is that Hootie and the Blowfish? Yeah. Oh, that's one of those songs you hear forever and never know where it... Mm. I, yeah. Alexa, find funerals near me. <laughs> um, I only had 4% battery, so I really wanted to get it in there. <laughs> okay, Google, how can we end the conflict in Yemen without <laughs> further bloodshed? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what... You know. <laughs> um, we should also mention cluster bombs while we're on the subject. Yes. Uh, so uh, Raytheon, uh, I looked at this a bit, Raytheon manufactures so-called joint standoff weapons, which are delivery system canisters that contain bomblets or explosive devices that can essentially be very easily turned into cluster bombs. Um, and, you know, Human, right, Human Rights Watch, among others, have, demonstra- have found evidence in terms of, you know, expended casings with Raytheon insignia on them being dropped in areas in Yemen. Um, but just like a, a random note is that... Uh, well, according to a Mother Jones article from 2016, apparently there was a study done and uh, civilians are 90%, 97% of cluster bomb casualties, or at least in 2015, uh, civilians were 97% of cluster bomb casualties and more than a third of them were children. Wow, 3% were actually hitting the targets? <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, is actually, like, that's really close to the main justification for the continued taboo on chemical weapons, right. like in the UN. Oh, is the, that there's, like, a, the in, indiscriminate nature of who it targets. Right, right. right. So It's like any weapon can target indiscriminately. And, like, it's a weird thing where, like, cluster bombs are officially outlawed by treaty, but this doesn't stop. There's uh, a convention on cluster munitions from uh, 2008, and yeah. uh, there are 108 signatories to it. Interestingly, uh, not including the United States and Saudi Arabia. Oh, well, I'm sure we'll get right on that. (laughs) Um, But so just a a random note is uh, the Norwegian uh, Ministry of Finance issued a report recommending uh, divesting uh, all of their oil pension fund uh, from, uh, among others, Raytheon, General Dynamics and Lockheed Martin, because these people all make cluster bombs. Uh, they might call them joint standoff weapons this or whatever. It sounds like stifling the entrepreneur. Whatever <laughs> whatever euphemism you want to use, these people are making cluster bombs which are being dropped on civilian areas and murdering lots of people. And, uh, you know, we mentioned Yemen, but it should be also noted in, like, Syria, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is funding some of the, the Sunni militias there. And so some of the weapons uh, that Raytheon or whoever sells to Saudi Arabia end up in Syria, they end up all over the place. Actually, uh, I was researching BAE systems for this, and the the prime minister's husband is yeah. the C- Theresa May Theresa of the United May's Kingdom. Husband Philip Philip May Philip is the British name. one of the directors of the capital investment group that is one of the largest stakeholders in BAE systems. Mm. You know what and I said? And their decision to uh, to launch airstrikes was they were carried out with six million dollars worth of BAE systems missile weapons Mm. well you know what I say to that maybe Philip may not (laughs) it'd be easier if their last names was should only wanna be the Jews That's the uh, the Hasidic theme song. I yes. only want to be with Jews. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, Saudi Arabia also uses uh, American supplied white phosphorus, which is uh, technically supposed to just create a thick white smoke for targeting purposes. Mm. Uh, but when it's used against people, it will maim and kill by burning to the bone. I like your delivery of that. You're like, hey, bad. You, know, you want to know something interesting? <laughs> hey Kev, you hear? You see this, Kev? You hear about this? <laughs> this white phosphorus. Here's, here's something that you might find interesting. Yeah, <laughs> white phosphorus is actually not just a targeting particle. I was using it to whiten my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> white phosphorus loves mayonnaise. We're five to an hour. All right. Uh, so there's all that, and then outside of Yemen, because you know we're at genocide, but let's go bigger. Uh, let's go to omnicide. I only want to be with me. You know what? You know, you know what's more, what's cooler yeah. than a genocide? <laughs> I think I've used, I've used that riff on every single episode, but damn it, it works here too. 
I stole it from me for the last episode for the Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, it has to be mentioned once. Yeah. So, uh, America's uh, nuclear missile uh, stockpile uh, is also made by private companies because, in true American fashion, even the end of the world is privatized. Uh, submarine launched Trident missiles are developed by Lockheed Martin. Hmm. And ICBM ground launched missiles, the Minuteman Three, is developed by Boeing. I love the idea of like a trader's final action on the stock market before the mushroom cloud comes is <laughs> issuing a buy order on Boeing stock. <laughs> <laughs> Give that one final. Yeah, yeah, big money. <laughs> so uh, as the hellfire engulfs you after. You know, uh, a series of say ninety nine red balloons fucks up a radar. Mm-hmm. Just know that you're 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 part of helping someone's bottom line. Yeah, um, and, and we can get back to uh, ICBMs, but I did kind of want to talk about how U.S. military actions are also kind of showcases for these uh, different companies. Oh God, yeah. Like yeah. Uh, uh, so interestingly, like um, Raytheon really became big. Like they did a bunch of other things, and you know, uh, I, I won't really go through the history. They did a uh, radar for the U.S. during World War II, but what really made their big break was the Gulf War, because you know the, these cruise missiles and other things that they sold were endlessly paraded on CNN. And President George H. W. Bush famously went to a Raytheon facility uh, in the middle of the war and said that they had shot down quote forty-one of forty-two Scud missiles with their Patriot interceptor systems. Uh, later, this was found to be bullshit. Is uh, that where he got confused by the barcode scanner? <laughs> <laughs> um, he was trying to check well, out. He just lied about that shit. He was just like, we got them, fuck them, they suck, buy this new shit. Right, so basically the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Legislation and National Security issued a report after this and said, quote, the Patriot missile system was not the spectacular success in the Persian Gulf War that the American public was led to believe. There's little evidence to prove that the Patriot hit more than a few Scud missiles launched by Iraq during the Gulf War, and there are some doubts about even the, these engagements. What? And so it's like George H.W. Bush, you know, praises the Scud, uh, the Patriot missiles, and then they, in turn, Raytheon, is able to sell these Patriots missile, Patriot missiles to uh, Saudi and Poland and all these other countries because, again, they were putting on a show. And it's the same with, like, um, this new uh, launching in Yemen. They're, uh, what is it, a new, uh, I forget if it's a Lockheed missile or something that they were displaying. But a lot of these kinds of things are, like, an opportunity for U.S. defense contractors to show off their technology and try to sell it to other governments. It's uh, how Boeing can show off how their uh, uh, smart bomb uh, attachment can really get some hard-to-reach weddings. You know who never shows off? Cockheed Martin. That guy's all substance, all 18 inches of him. <laughs> That's the 2% of the other investment news. Talk to the mic, Steven. <laughs> Sorry. The 2% from their budget that is just listed as others going to Cockheed Martin. <laughs> yeah. Um, research, but I want it to. I want it to get a bit to ownership. If we have time for that, I want to talk about ownership. We can talk about the ICBMs before we run out of time here. And then Raytheon did an interesting thing with California prisons. Maybe I'll just start there. So the Raytheon uh, contracted with uh, California. I think it's Pitches De- Detention Center, north of Los Angeles, for a prisoner zap system called Silent Guardian. <laughs> and uh, there's an NPR article on this. I'll link in the Tumblr. But basically, it's like it, it looks like a giant dental X-ray machine. And so with, uh, I'm quoting from NPR here, with a remote control device, guards can focus on specific targets using a monitor and a joystick. And then uh, quoting from the Raytheon uh, uh, spokesperson, it penetrates about a 64th of an inch under your skin. That's about where your pain receptors are. So that's what it feel lo- fe- would feel like if you just open up the doors of a blast furnace. You feel this wave of heat immediately. And it's a, um, uh, what's it called? But basically, it's like a... Uh, 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 a giant a burning sensation under your skin and it, they can use this for uh, prisoner control uh, it uses some sort of waves uh, millimeter waves that's what it is uh, the device sends out millimeter waves creating a quote harmless but intense sensation and so the this California prison is going to the ACL excruciating torture <laughs> yeah. um, for some uh, millimeter waves fall under a uh, uh, 
a class of waves that might also be known as microwaves. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty literally just cooking your skin next to your paint or your Yeah, how quick can they do a hot pocket with this stuff? Yeah. Cause I'm tired of waiting 60 seconds. I want it done in five. Interesting. Uh, in, the, in my course of researching Raytheon, uh, one of their employees invented the microwave oven oh. in 1945. Oh, congrats. Yeah. Uh, and also, they made a lot of money on their microwaves, but in the 90s, sold that business and now focus entirely on blowing up people at weddings. <laughs> um, but for some reason in this article... Gotta keep it hot. Gotta uh, keep it crispy. For some reason, there's a real party pooper ACLU attorney quoted in this article... Uh, who says, quote, we're going to use people in jail as guinea pigs for some mega arms builder to Ooh. test their device. Uh, he says some of these tests have badly burned people with repeated zaps, and he notes that Los Angeles de- deputies have a documented history of abusing inmates. Uh, he suggests a better solution would be to find uh, uh, solutions that prevent prison overcrowding conditions that trigger jail riots instead of you know cooking them with microwaves. Well, I mean, maybe they should have thought about that before they uh, decided to light up some of that gonge. But it's just like, uh, it's just kind of a dystopian, horrifying thing. Because like another thing I read about Raytheon is they have their own little Palantir system, which they sell to various governments, which uses your social media presence to find out your location and information about you. And oh, again, it's these... great that a missile targeting company has that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, so it's, you think twice about checking in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's just kind of like this dystopian thing where they have like this fucking microwave crowd control system that they're testing on prisoners uh, before rolling it out to the general populace writ large. Uh, so you know, keep an eye on that one. Oh yeah, you know, I'm looking forward to choosing to have that put in my arm as a consumer in the free market. You know who always checks in? Cocky Martin. <laughs> you already made that one. He's all about consent. <laughs> I think I made that joke. Uh, I mean, I'm not proud of it. Let's move on. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, Try to keep this light, Sean, okay? One of us has to be silly. Yeah. No, it, it's important when, when Andy's droning on about, <laughs> literally droning on about the <laughs> genocide in Yemen, <laughs> that somebody's there to make the cocky Martin and the Houthi and the Blowfish <laughs> jokes. Look, that's what people tune in for. All 100 of them. Don't insult it's, it's the just, people that like us, John. Yes. It's just as bad or worse than what's going on in Syria, and we have the power to stop it. So what are we going to talk about? I know. It's important we talk about these issues. Don't get me wrong. We don't have to... We have to talk bomb. about the crimes of the Houthi. We don't have to bomb Assad. We can... If you want to save a lot of lives, you can get your well, we country to stop supporting Syria. We should mention that, by the way, because Syria. Senators, uh, Saudi Arabia. Senators Sanders, Lee, and Murphy, Chris Murphy of Connecticut, Mike Lee of uh, Utah, Republican, they introduced a war powers resolution on Yemen to essentially say Congress has to sign off, otherwise the U.S. has to withdraw their soldiers from there and stop assisting the Saudi military. They introduced this in the Senate. It was defeated, I believe, 55 to 45 with 10 Democrats, 10 Democrats voting uh, to keep the war in Yemen going indefinitely, one of whom was, uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, uh, Joe Donnelly, Democrat of Indiana. So, you know, important we keep that safe. Hey, congrats to him. Um, Good job, Joe. Yeah. But serious... uh uh, serious thanks to Sanders and Murphy and was that Warren you said? Uh, uh, Murphy and Lee, uh, actually Lee. Mike Lee, Republican of Utah. So good for him. You can't insert Warren into everything that's good, Andy. <laughs> I believe Warren did I vote that to was end only the war Warren. in Yemen. Yeah. Where did Schumer vote? Because oh, yeah, you know good. we'll get we'll get back to this, but <laughs> my we'll money's Tumblr. I we'll... got my money on uh, Schumer voting to continue. Schumer's whole deal is like. Uh, I doubt it. He's just smart. He's yeah, smart he just kind of like he allows Wall Street repeal to go to the floor, but he doesn't vote for it. Oh. Um, no, Schumer either abstained or voted against it. And it's important to note that this genocide was sanctioned by Obama. Yes. Like, as bad as Trump is continuing it, and he's expanding the weapon sales, this did start under Obama. It's one of the weirdest and more horrifying things Obama did, is uh, essentially allow U.S. Uh, forces to be deployed in service of a mass murder campaign. Uh, where and he didn't even close Guantanamo. He made it 24 hours. <laughs> And when the uh, blockade was put in front of the UN, it was supported by Samantha Powers, who is also known as writing a book called uh, "A Problem from Hell." A problem from oh hell God. about U.S. inaction in the face of genocide. 
So that's probably the first time I can think of where someone who wrote a book about how terrible genocide is was complicit in a genocide. Uh, well, no, Hitler wrote a book about white genocide. <laughs> Um, co-wrote <laughs> yeah, it's true he did actually dictate most of that book in prison i know a lot about hitler <laughs> <laughs> no one shocked sean that's gonna be a future job uh, um, <laughs> before we run out of time i do want to talk about who actually owns these weapons manufacturers because it is a fascinating thing to dig into because as we've mentioned these we- there's so much money in war and like who profits from it well uh, uh, in the case of Raytheon, it's mostly... Who are the innovators who are being rewarded for their foresight? Yes, outside of for Darius taking the risk. Right. Yeah, for taking the risk. Uh, in the case of Raytheon, it's mostly institutional investors. It's a publicly traded company. So you have like Black, BlackRock. Um, I believe this is as of December... Uh, yeah. yeah, well, BlackRock, actually. I don't know how I much... will say as a side note, uh, yes. we've talked about playing our uh, market game. And Steven's still winning... Uh, because we all started right after there was a drop in the market, and then he came in right after that, and so didn't lose as much money as the rest of us. But I'm catching up, mm-hmm. and I'm only investing in Boeing, Raytheon, and Northrop Grumman. Well, don't worry, Andy. When Trump walks out of the North Korea peace talks, he will win the game automatically. <laughs> um, but so, uh, just in the case of Raytheon, and uh, from what I've looked at, most of the uh, uh, big five are in similar situations, but... Uh, the biggest institutional owner is the Vanguard Group. They do the famous Vanguard's uh, ETFs and such. Mutual funds. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you also have BlackRock Incorporated. They own 7.36%. State Street owns 4.34%. Again, as of December 2017, this is Raytheon. Uh, Bank of America owns 2.11%. Uh, Fidelity, you might have seen their commercials. They are famously owned by the Johnson family billionaires, as uh, you know, as of Johnson & Johnson. Um, uh, Fidelity owns, I believe, two uh, two point five three percent of Raytheon, uh, and uh, BlackRock CEO uh, Larry Fink is another billionaire. We'll talk about in the future. So essentially, like, it's an interesting kind of shell game where all of these banks and financial services and whatever own large stakes in the weapons co- uh, companies. So you know, it's it's kind of one of those things that occasionally you'll see the woke take on the internet that like only white guys care about Wall Street when Wall Street entirely profits from and encourages this massive defense spending because uh, in addition to being a subsidy to the defense industry, uh, uh, weapons spending by the U.S. government is a subsidy to Wall Street because they are the ones who fucking own all these companies. So it's just kind of a horrifying onion once you peel back the layers. Yeah, okay, Man. straight white dude, bro. <laughs> what a time to be white. <laughs> uh, God, I'm just tired of being attacked on Twitter. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll dial it back. <laughs> oh, God. Um, but, yeah. I what mean, else we got? We're running over. Uh, I think we hit most of the, the basics. Uh, we um, Raytheon, uh, among others, has had multiple both uh, scandals in uh, environmental problems, both in Arizona and Florida. Un- unsurprisingly, making uh, missiles and uh, other such things, uh, if you don't really give a shit about the environment, can make uh, groundwater pollute it. Um, so they've had those. They've had scandals uh, with cost overruns with the Pentagon. They've been given slap on the wrist fines on many occasions. Uh, they've had bribery scandals. They sold Brazil, uh, <laughs> like some radar system that they bribed the president, among oh other God, people, really? to, yes. to get them to approve of. Oh, um, yeah. You know, so it's just like that kind of stuff. Uh, social media monitoring, cluster bombs. All with a small loan from friends and family. Exactly. <laughs> oh, that trust fund. Yeah, I've heard about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just something where it's it's kind of horrifying. Uh, so wait, not only is the weapon manufacturers of this country making bank on killing people, but then companies that make money off of money are making money off people killing people? Of course, yeah. Wow, mm-hmm. capitalism. Yeah. What oh, a yeah. box of problems. In the long and short. But yeah, no, it was pretty interesting for me doing this research and just finding out how much, you know, a, a bank of New York Mellon, we've mentioned them on a previous episode, they own 1.45%. Um, I think I mentioned Bank of America owns 2.11% of Raytheon. Deutsche Bank owns 1.26%. So it's like... Lululemon owns 11%. <laughs> <laughs> I made that one up. It's not real. Uh, 
But yeah. Yet. Not real. Yet. I mean, Gee, I wish we had one of them doomsday machines. Thank you. I don't know. If you're it's wondering, investment advice. <laughs> if you're wondering why the stock market goes up uh, when Trump bombs people, just uh, check back uh, on the public uh, declarations of ownership, and uh, you'll be um, pleasantly surprised by what you find. <laughs> And with that, <laughs> this has been Grubstakers. Uh, come out April 30th to Brooklyn House of Comedy. Hell yes. Uh, Quick Sid Comedy with uh, Shay Torres, Mike Drucker, Marshall Belsky, Brian Yang, uh, Kenise Mobley, Amanda Hurley, hosted by yours truly, Yogi Polywall. They're doing a Yemen genocide theme <laughs> show. Yeah. All of them will be talking about the cholera <laughs> epidemic That's among right. yeah. the children. Should be, should be a fun night. <laughs> Five dollar cover to drink. <laughs> It'll be like a giant display of like a starving child in the background. It's the ultimate comedic challenge: is if you can make people laugh with a picture of a starving child behind you. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna try and do everything but what Sean just said. Um, but with that, cut that. Uh, my name's Yogi Polywall. I'm Andy Palmer. Sean McCarthy. Steve Jeffries. All right, thanks for listening. 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 All right, thanks for listening.